This episode is the video that starts off introducing you to the concept of the self and the concept of cultural domains. Let's start off by talking about Game of Thrones. Now, not everyone has seen Game of Thrones, but a lot of people have. It was, and at the time of making this video, still is, reported by IMDb at least, the most popular TV show ever. It's a bit dated now, the last show aired in 2019, but I'm wanting to talk about it with you because the show had something very interesting to say about a couple of things that are central to this unit. If you haven't seen Game of Thrones, then what's wrong with you? Where have you been? Uh, but uh, it's actually fine. You, you don't have to have seen it. Um, but if you haven't watched it and you want to watch it, I'll try not to put in any spoilers into this episode. You know how it ends. Except I will tell you that series six onwards was a bit crap. Now, Series 1 to 5 of Game of Thrones really grabbed people's attention and has been described as changing the way we think of TV dramas. It was the storytelling that appeared unique because our favourite characters got killed off really early and there were no clear heroes or villains in the stories. It was really hard to find someone to fully hate or to fully love. He's talking about you. What? And the characters were complex. They didn't fit easily into that good and evil binary. And they were kind of unimportant. And that was signified by how often a character we would think was central to the storyline just got killed off. He's dead. He's dead. No, he's dead. Is he dead yet? It was more about families and clans, what the show called houses, than about individuals. So we had the House of Stark, Aaron, Tully, Barofian, Lannister and Tyrell. From series six onwards, things changed. And that's because the books upon which the series was based just ran out. The author, George M Martin, never got around to finishing off the story. So the producers brought in some Hollywood scriptwriters to continue the series and then to bring the series to its conclusion. And probably because those were Hollywood scriptwriters, they brought with them that storytelling that we're more used to, the ones that most Hollywood films are based on, the narrative of the hero and the villain, and where the individual, not the group, is central. So the characters from series six onwards in Game of Thrones um, started to lose their complexity. They became either good or bad, you know, heroes or villains. But at the same time, the characters grew in their individual importance to the storyline. And you'd think people would like that because this is a narrative we're more used to, but we didn't like it. We were disappointed in what happened to Game of Thrones. Now, I've put an interesting little article on this on our University Moodle site. And for those of you who can't access the Moodle site, I'll put the reference to the paper in the YouTube description box. And in that paper, you'll see how Game of Thrones is linked to two key things on this unit. The first is the concept of the self, specifically the contrast between the individual self and the social self. And second is the concept of cultural dimensions, specifically the contrast between individualism and collectivism. Now, before we get into these two concepts, let me tell you four questions that the two concepts ask. Can the self be separate from the other. Two, is the self consistent and stable? Three, can the individual ever be separated from the group? And four, is the individual more important than the group? Now let's start off with the concept of the self. What is this thing we call self? Well, we use the word all the time, myself, yourself, and so on. Essentially, it's the answer to the question, who am I? 
And there are two broad categories to those answers, which are the individual self and the social self. And I'll explain some more about those two things in a while. But first, let's just see how mainstream psychology answers those first two questions. Is the self separate from the other? And is the self consistent and stable? Mainstream psychology would answer yes, the self is separate from the other. And yes, the self is normally consistent and stable. Indeed, when we can't separate self from other, that's a sign of psychological immaturity, that, the, that we lack a theory of mind. And when self becomes inconsistent and unstable, that's seen as, sign of, as a sign of mental illness. And more about mental illness in a later episode. And that's a good episode. Now, what we have here is psychology's large-scale adoption of the individual self and a rejection of the social self. Because for the concept of the social self, the answer to those two questions is no. And that's because for the social self, who you are is largely determined by the relationships you have with the people around you and how those people think of you. For the individual self, who you are is largely determined by your relationship with yourself and how you think of yourself. Now, how about that thing about cultural dimensions? Now, this is in relation to those other two questions. If you were to ask mainstream psychology if the individual can ever be separated from the group or if the individual is more important than a group, mainstream psychology would again answer yes to both of those questions. And what we have here is an adoption of individualism and a rejection of collectivism. And individualism is where a culture promotes the belief that each person should think and act independently of others. And here it's about personal goals, working in your own best interests and the promotion of your personal identity. Collectivism is where a culture promotes the belief that community is important and that people have a responsibility to each other, that people are interdependent, they rely on each other. And it's all about the collective goals, working in the public interest and the promotion of the collective identity. And mainstream psychology is very much structured to promote individualism. Now, the other central question we have, which we ask in psychology, is can we truly ever know ourselves and can other people truly ever know us? And the way psychology has framed that question is largely methodologically. And that turns the question into something like this. Can we know ourselves through introspection or can we be known through independent observation? And mainstream psychology has answered that. And for many in psychology, they imagine that this question no longer needs to be asked because the answer is no. We can't know ourselves through introspection because that can only be subjective. And yes, we can be known through independent observation because that can be done objectively. And one final question is, is our behavior determined by our genetics or by our environment? And this one, if you've studied psychology for a while, will be more familiar to you. This is the nature-nurture debate, which is still alive and well in psychology. People still argue it. And, um, but there is on the, there is one side that's winning this at the moment. Now, essentially, all these questions stem from those opening questions in relation to psychology's stance towards the concept of self and towards cultural dimensions. You know, are we separate autonomous selves or is the self and the other entwined? Are we independent of others or are we interdependent on others? And apart from the nature-nurture one, which is still bobbling away, um, and people are still arguing over it, though one side is dominating the argument. Mainstream psychology has answered those other questions quite forcefully, such that the answers have become baked into the discipline, into the discipline of mainstream psychology. 
you'd hardly realise that those questions were even asked because the answers have largely become axiomatic truths. And axiomatic truths are where a thing is taken to be true without the need to consider the evidence determine, to determine if it is, in fact, actually true. It's taken for granted that these things are true. So yes, the self is normally consistent and stable, and yes, you can understand a person through observing them. It's self-evident. No need to interrogate that at all. And that's where critical social psychology comes in, because we say, hold on, let's interrogate, let's interrogate that. And your job on this unit is to do just that. You need to do that to psychology through reviewing the Rosenhan paper and decoding how Rosenhan managed to unsettle some of these axiomatic truths. And you'll be doing that interrogation in your diaries as well, when you're looking at mainstream psychology and critiquing the ideas that come from mainstream psychology. And you'll be doing it in assessment three, which is the essay. Again, you'll be taking that critical look at mainstream psychology, particularly in relation to how it's done a disservice to particular groups in society. Now, that's all for this video, for this episode. And in the next episode, I want to talk a bit more about that axiomatic truth that says we can't know ourselves through introspection. And I want to talk about those cultural domains and start to offer you a critique of what you'll find in chapter two of our prescribed text on social psychology. So, till that next episode, ta -da.